getting a little toasty in here. Uh, looks like the uh, air conditioner is kind of messing up a little bit again, so we'll have to uh, kind of get a, take a look at that. Um, but the Lord is blessed. We made it through most of the summer, and so we'll see what uh, happens next. Uh, so be sure I uh, will add that to the prayer list uh, about what to do about the air conditioner and need to figure that out. Um, also this morning I forgot to mention, uh, as you think about prayer requests, um, if you would pray for Sierra. Uh, she's been having problems with her foot for quite a while now. Um, kind of messed it up here a while back while she's out and about and uh, never has gotten better. So she's got a some physical therapy coming up here in the next few weeks. So uh, remember her, if you would, that the Lord would provide healing for that. All right. Well, I tell you what, uh, we are going to try and finish Psalms chapter 18. Psalms chapter 18. Um, we've been preaching out of Psalms 18 off and on. Uh, we... We hit a couple, and then we missed a few weeks, and then I picked it up again um, on Sunday for Sunday school and uh, intended to make it all the way through then and didn't. So we still got a little ways to go here in Psalm chapter 18. Uh, I did feel better when I realized that, you know, in other chapters in Psalms, we might only have 10 verses, and a whole sermon would take, you know, 10 verses would take a whole sermon. Well, this is 50 verses, so that means I get five tries, right? Uh, see if I can get this done. But no, Psalms chapter 18. Uh, really, if you were to put a title on this um, on this psalm, uh, a good one would be "The Lord is our rock and our fortress." Right. And uh, to give you the history again, not to go through all this, but uh, this is not the only place that this entire chapter is given. Um, the postscript to this chapter talks about. Uh, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hands of Saul. That was kind of the, the postscript to this, um, to this uh, psalm. And as you think about it, it is history. <laughs> it's in 2 Samuel. Chapter 22, that's the other place that this entire chapter is found, almost word for word. The entire chapter is repeated twice in the Bible. The first time in 2 Samuel, as the event occurs, it seems, like as he's just wrapped up defeating some of his final enemies and he's kind of getting on and toward the later years of his life and, and things along those lines, he kind of sits down and seems to write this hymn and then it shows up in the book of Psalms. Now, there are some references really in this chapter to the Messiah. We have not really tackled our study of Psalms 18 coming at it from the perspective of the Messiah, but have really focused more on uh, the historical side of this uh, psalm since it deals with David's victory over his enemies. Um, we started the psalm uh, kind of dealing with uh, the, the declaration of David in the first few verses about, uh, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, and whom will I trust? My buckler, the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. Uh, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So he's declaring who God is, but not just who God is, but who God is to him, right? My God, my deliverer, my shield my fortress. Uh, he goes on and he starts to describe his condition. If you remember, uh, the sorrows of death compassed me. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. Man, he is describing time and time again, he has been at death's door and the Lord delivers. The Lord provides. The Lord gives him victory. Uh, and then what we did here um, on at Sunday school, we kind of went over 
and we talked about how starting in, in really in verse 7, you see this great picture of the Lord's judgment and how it's swift and it's sure. And if you are the one being delivered, it's majestic. And if you're the one that's the enemy, it's horrible and terrifying. And that all of the things of the Lord are at his disposal. Uh, the wind and the lightning and the thundering and hail and fire and uh, just this picture that you get of the majesty of the Lord's deliverance or the terribleness of his judgment. And um, it just goes on for quite a while. But then it also, in the middle of all that, it talks about how that he delivered uh, the psalmist. And we kind of went over all of that last time. Really where we're picking up now, um, well, let me go over one other thing that we covered is he goes through this stretch where he's talking about how that he was, uh, he was faithful and he was studying the word, the word of the Lord and that he was, uh, the Lord was recompensing him for, the, for his, uh, his righteousness. Um, un understand that we are talking about, when, when we cover that, you can't earn your salvation. The psalmist here is not talking about his salvation. He is talking about the Lord's blessing uh, in his uh, earthly, physical <laughs> obstacles, challenges, right? And that the Lord had blessed him uh, and that the Lord returns mercy for mercy and that if you're forward, well, the Lord's going to be forward with you. Uh, it's this idea of you reap what you sow kind of, right? So there's some very practical applications there of you want the blessings of the Lord? Well, you need to draw close to him. You need to stay on his path. You need to follow his statutes. You need to follow his commands. The Lord's not going to bless if you're not doing those things. Um, and so we talked a little bit about that. But what we want you to notice, too, is that throughout the psalm, he might start to talk about himself a little bit, but invariably he comes back and lays all of the glory, all of the credit at the Lord's feet. Even in that stretch where he talked about how he was following God and he was following his statutes and he was not getting off into iniquity, literally he came and laid all that at the feet of the Lord. He's like, mm, the Lord's my strength. The Lord's my deliverer. The Lord's the light of my path. He's the one that opens my, uh, he's the one that lights the candle to the path and enlightens my way, right? So he's always constantly throughout this hymn going back and giving praise to God. Now, if we pick up, let's just start in verse 1. We already covered a couple of these verses, but to get context, we'll start in verse 31. Psalms 18, verse 31. For who is God save the Lord, or who is a rock save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. Again, who's getting credit? He's just went through all the things he's been able to do. Well, who gets credit? God does, right? But he keeps going and he says, he maketh my feet like hinds feet. He setteth me upon high places. It's interesting when you look at this, uh, he giveth me feet like hinds feet. Uh, that's really something that, especially I'm looking at the, at the kids here. Uh, you may not know what a hind is. Um, you may be guessing incorrectly. Uh, if you try to guess what a hind is, um, a hind is a deer. Yeah, I weren't expecting that, were you? Uh-huh, I didn't think so. So what does he mean when he says that he maketh my feet like hind's feet? Have you ever seen a deer? Well, one, they're really graceful. But two, man, you want to watch those things? When they start going, they can leap, <laughs> Right? Man, he is talking about the strength and the gracefulness and just the ability to get going, right? What's he saying? The Lord is the one that gives me the strength that I need. The Lord is the one that gives me that ability. And he setteth me upon high places. Verse 34, he teacheth me, he teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by my arms. Listen, David was a warrior. David was a warrior. You don't have to study much of David's life to know that, man, that guy could fight. 
You know who he said taught him that? You know who he said give him the ability to do that? God did. He said, he, he teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. The picture there is a bow made of steel, a bow made of, man, this is something that's not easily broken. And yet David's ability that the Lord had given him in battle, in strategy, in ability, it didn't matter if the enemies had bows of steel. David was going to have victory. And he recognizes that that knowledge, that ability came from God. In verse 35, thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation. Right? Listen, he says, you know what? The protection that I have, I know exactly where it comes from. It's you that saved me, Lord. It's you that delivered me. Hey, listen, I might know how to battle. I might know how to fight. I might know, have a great strategy. But I know that my salvation came from God. There's times when we may get down and discouraged and, and, we, and we need to lean on the Lord, right? And it's in those times we realize how weak we really are. And we praise Him and we seek Him and we want Him to help us. Can you have that same attitude when you're winning? When you're able to break the bands of steel, when you're able to conquer your enemies, when you're able to, to have all this great success, can you turn around and go, I couldn't do any of that without the Lord by my side? He says, And thy right hand hath hold me up, and thy gentleness hath made me great. This word, so his right hand holdeth me up. His right hand of strength holds him up, man. Listen, he knows that he could not stand without the Lord. But he also uses this phrase, thy gentleness hath made me great. I, I struggled with that a little bit as I read it. Like, what does he mean? So I worked up, looked up that word gentleness. It's this idea of, you might associate it with the word humble, but it really, it's just more than humble. It's, it's this person of great strength that's humbling themselves and coming down to us, right? He says, you know what? It's your, it's your humbleness, Lord. It's your, uh, it's your gentleness that has come and made me great. He's recognizing in this the Lord's power, and yet the fact that the Lord was stooping down to help him, right? It's his gentleness that has made me great. Verse 36, Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, that my feet did not slip. David looks back on his life. He looks at the times maybe when he was heading right toward Goliath with his sling, the times that he was running from Saul, the times that he was battling the Philistines, and he thinks about, man, just one, one slip, one trip, one time at the wrong moment, and I could have been in, Lord, I know that it was you that kept me. I personally don't know that he's just speaking of battling the physical enemies, but man, it's the Lord that has kept him on the path <laughs> that he needs to be, right? But that idea of his enlarged my steps under me that my feet did not slip. You know what I think about when I think about this? <clears throat> I think about grandma and grandpa's steps going down into the basement. And those suckers are narrow. You either have to walk on the heels of your feet or you have to turn your feet sideways, right? The Lord has enlarged <laughs> my steps under me that I don't slip. Um, he has made his paths sure and steady he's not stepping out onto something that's unsure but he's enlarged his steps that he's not falling verse 39 for thou hast girded me with strength under the battle thou hast subdued under me those that rose up against me man these are the passages of great victory 
right? He's fast. He's sure-footed. Uh, he has great battle abilities. Um, he's, he's got a shield. He's got weapons. And yet all of this just constantly comes back and says, it's you, God. It's you, God. All along the way, it's you. I know it's you. It's you. I also want to remind you just how much despair David was under prior to this. How did he describe himself? Basically at death's door. <laughs> uh, he described himself as being flooded with evil men. And when he talked about the Lord's deliverance, he literally gave us this picture of the Lord reaching down and grabbing him out of the floods, the waters, the abundant waters that were overwhelming him. You remember how the first chapter, half of this chapter went? But now David is looking back after the Lord has provided victory. And yes, he can remember what it felt like when there didn't seem to be any hope. He remembered what it was like to be chased throughout the hills while Saul was on his heels. He remembered what it was like to be up against uh, larger armies. He remembered what it was like when the plague was wiping people out and he had to go to the Lord and say, what is going on? And he had to say, well, because of what Saul did, this is happening. He remembers those times. But now he's also looking back on those times and saying, each and every one of them, Lord, you came in and you provided deliverance. You lifted me out of those troubled times. You set my feet on solid ground. And this has turned into really shouts of victory in the latter half of this chapter. <clears throat> it says, I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. I have wounded them that were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. For thou hast girded me with strength unto battle. Thou hast subdued under me those that rose up against me. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies that I might destroy them that hate me. They cried, but there was none to save them, even unto the Lord, but he answered them not. The Lord has provided so much deliverance that David is not only able to get away from his enemies, but David has turned the tides and literally has provided, uh, the Lord has provided victory over those enemies. Not just deliverance from the enemies, victory over the enemies. And his enemies have now been destroyed. David is looking back and he's seeing that the enemies that he had have been destroyed. Literally, by the time David hands off the reins to Solomon, the, the nation was really, for the most part, at peace. Which is saying a lot for some of the battles they'd had up to that point. But David's able to look back and see how the Lord has delivered the enemies. And listen, it got to the point where the enemies... When they realized what was happening, they had no one to cry out to. I think it's just showing a, how total the victory was. And even some of them cried out to the Lord, it says. At first it says they didn't have anybody to cry out to, but then it says even the Lord. And it talks about how that he would not answer them. Interestingly enough, when you look at David's life, there were times in David's life where his enemies were saying about David, God won't hear him. Jehovah won't hear David. But yet the Lord turned the tables. David gets victory. David gets delivered. David conquers the enemy. And the enemy is now has no mercy, even from the Lord. You see just the total, complete change the way the Lord can take things and man he can just flip it around now I'm going to pause here for a second and understand that when most people read Psalms 18 if you look at most commentaries they're not going to talk much about David they're not going to talk about the historical aspects of Psalms 18 they are going to apply the entire chapter to the Messiah I don't do that. I don't have a problem with that, so to speak, because I think there is a lot in this chapter that you can apply to the Lord. Um, but I'm going to come back and say again, 
we are told in 2 Samuel chapter 22 that David wrote this the day he had victory over his enemies. There is obviously an aspect that is very much applicable to David. Can you apply it? Absolutely. Was the Lord overrun with his enemies? Yes. <laughs> Was he at death's door? You could actually say he walked through death's door. But he rose again. Did the Lord turn the night into day, or in the night, uh, the day into night when the Lord was on the cross? Was there thunderings? Was there earthquakes when he died? Yeah, all those things did happen. Yes. Is there going to be even more of that when he comes back and he returns and he shows that, hey, look, not only did he have victory over death, but there's coming a time where he is going to come back and he is going to have victory over all of his enemies. Yes, absolutely. You can apply this chapter to the Messiah when you look at Revelations and him coming back as, as judge, coming back as king, right? And he really will grind his enemies into dust. So I have no problems talking about this chapter from a Messiah perspective. And I just mention that because as we go through each section, I've been talking about how it applies to David. Totally fine applying it to the Messiah, too. Oftentimes the Psalms are like that. There is a physical, historical perspective, but there's also a lot of prophetic expect, uh, aspects to it as well. All right, so uh, we have here that um, we're down here, and we know that he has turned, and they've been consumed. Uh, in verse uh, 41, they cried, but there was none to save them, even unto the Lord, but he answered them not. Verse 42, then did I beat them small as the dust before the wind. I cast them out as dirt into the streets. Thou hast delivered me from the strivings of the people. Thou hast made me the head of, a he of the heathen. A people whom I have not known shall serve me. And as soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. The strangers shall submit themselves unto me. The strangers shall fade away and be afraid out of their close places. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Man, he has just given us this amazing string of victory. And what a drastic turn from a guy that's at death's door. And yet when he looks back, he says, yeah, many times I was at death's door. But man, the Lord stepped in. The Lord delivered me. He gave me exactly what I needed. He, he made me on, on solid ground. And, and he delivered me, so much so that I've crushed my enemies. I've turned them to dust. Uh, there's none left to fight against me. And it's God. It's all God. Over and over again he says this. He also talks about how that in this section that we just read, he talks about how that the heathen would see this and that they would turn. Uh, he even says that they would hear as soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. The strangers shall submit themselves unto me. Listen, David had victory. And even those foreign lands that one day thought of ruling, well, now the tables have turned. And really, they're having to obey obeisance to David and to his kingdom. You can apply that to the Messiah, too, by the way, as you think about it. Right? Right? Was he despised and rejected? Yep. But now nations have heard of him. Heathen nations have heard of him and turned to him and obey him. Right? So absolutely there is an aspect of this that can be applied to the Messiah. <laughs> Verse 45, the stranger shall fade away and be afraid out of their close places. It's just like, man, that guy that was once uh, in your face trying to get at you, well, that man, he just fades away. But I love what he does here in verse 46. The Lord liveth. The Lord liveth. It's an interesting thing to say, really, when you think about it. Um, he's telling you that we serve a living God. It's not, this is not some God made out of rock or wood made by hands of man. This is, this is the self-existing one. 
Jehovah liveth is really what he said here, right? Jehovah liveth. It's an active thing. God is present in our life. God is active in our life. We've talked about the fact that so many people worship uh, gods made by hands, but even the ones that make idols and they think that they're, that they're making them to some living God somewhere, you study, pagan, you study pagan gods, man, they did not like their servants. <laughs> it was not a good relationship. But our God lives, and He's ever-present with us, and He is our deliverer, our shield, our salvation, our refuge, our rock. He cares about us. He humbles Himself. Remember that your gentleness has made me great. Man, you, the mighty one, stooping down to my level to help me. <laughs> that is actually really describing the mercy and grace of God. In verse 47, It is God that avengeth me and subdueth the people under me. When you go back and you read 2 Samuel and the chapters leading up to 2 Samuel chapter 22, listen, David was out in the field of battle. Matter of fact, David fought on into his life to the point where his own soldiers had to tell him, you're not coming with us next time because you're getting kind of old and faint in the battle. Listen, David is a guy that was very active in the battles he's talking about carried a sword, led the soldiers. And yet, what does he say? It is God that avengeth me and subdueth the people under me. God has placed me here. God has delivered me. God has blessed me. It's God, it's God, it's God, it's God. You notice in a theme? I'm trying as hard as I can to get you to see it if you haven't already. Verse 48, He delivered me from mine enemies. <laughs> yea, thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. What was it he said way back at the beginning? It was like floods of ungodly men surrounded him. Now down here at the end, he says, you have delivered me from mine enemies. Thou hast lifted me up above those that rise up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Do you believe God can do this? I'm afraid sometimes we think about these stories and we relegate it to the Davids and the Daniels. Listen, God can deliver you. I don't know what it is that you're fighting against, whether it's internal struggles, whether it's struggles in your, in your family, in your, in your situations, whether it's uh, enemies attacking you, whether it's health situation. I don't know what all those things are. But God is able to deliver you. Now, I'm not up here preaching health and wellness and prosperity. I'm saying God can. Are you willing to follow him wherever he leads? I actually believe that David was one of those guys. You know what? If the Lord had not delivered him from some of these situations, you know enough about David to know that like, if the Lord led him somewhere, he was going to go. We need to be like that. And when the Lord did deliver... He would shout the Lord's praise from the hilltops. Matter of fact, in verse 49, Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises unto thy name. Again, we're coming at this from the historical perspective of David writing this about his life. David did, when you go back and look, and you read the whole story of David, 
David did some amazing things. Amazing things. And when David looked back on what he had done, do you know what the conclusion of his thoughts were? Therefore, really means because, right? All the stuff I just described. David has given us 48 verses of stuff up to this point. And he ends those 48 verses with this statement. Therefore, because of all this, will I give thanks unto thee, O Jehovah, among the heathen, and sing praises unto thy name. You've delivered me, and I'm going to sing your praises. I don't care who's around. Listen, because of the way the Lord had delivered and the example that the Lord had given, there would be heathen nations around them that would hear David declare the glory of the living God, Jehovah. I will praise you among the heathen and sing praises unto thy name. In verse 50, he says, Great deliverance giveth he to his king. David as king says, I know where my deliverance came from. It came from Jehovah. And showeth mercy to his anointed, to David, and to his seed forevermore. Listen, David knew the promise of God. David knew that through his king, kingly line, there would be one that would rule forever. David had that promise. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that. Jesus Christ is the son of David that will rule for eternity. David in praise declares God's majesty and God's deliverance and God's mercy. And then he says, and I know that you have blessed me and I know that you are going to bless my seed forever. That is a totally different response than the guy that felt like the evil men were about to overwhelm him and that he was at death's door any moment. Now he's saying, you've established me. Lord, you've blessed, you've shown mercy. I know it's you. Don't forget, by the way, and I've said this multiple times, this is toward the end of David. This is later on in David's life, looking back at all of the victory that God has done in his life. And I believe looking ahead to the time when the next king would come, but probably even further looking ahead to when the king of kings would come. It's this passage in verse 49 that is actually quoted in the New Testament. And we actually covered it when we went through uh, the book of Romans. But if you would, go ahead and uh, we'll turn over there. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Now I'm going to start at the top of the chapter. But it's really chapter, it's really verse uh, 9 that we're building up to. Uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 1, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us bless his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant to you, you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Now think about this. In Romans, he just said that you need to be like-minded one toward another. If you remember a lot of the theme of Romans, he's talking to Jew and Gentile and talking about needing to bring those two together. Hey, Jewish person, it's not just the Jews that have God's grace and mercy. Hey, Gentile, hey, look, these are your brothers now. <laughs> be like-minded. But he goes in verse 6, That ye may be with one mind and one mouth, glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Wherefore receive ye one another, as Christ also received the glory of God, uh, received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Jesus Christ came and fulfilled the promises that had been given. Jesus Christ's ministry time and time again fulfilled what had been given. Verse 9, And that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy, as it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. That is really a quote from Psalms chapter 18. The word Gentile is used versus heathen, but that's what that is. Listen, the ministry and the work of Jesus Christ, although a lot of this happened after his earthly ministry, after he'd already been risen and, and uh, ascended back into heaven. Listen, you see through especially the, the, the life of, of Paul, the apostle, what happens? The glory of God begins to be declared among the heathen, among the Gentiles, and his name is praised, and they turn and they obey the Lord. Romans 15 is reminding us, listen, way back in David's day, he declared that the glory of God would be declared among the heathen and that the Lord would be praised among them. That's exactly what happened. I believe it's from a physical perspective. Yes, that did happen in David's time. The heathen nations around David saw the glory of God. But you know what happened when the Lord Jesus Christ came, lived, died, rose again? That glory spread across all nations, fulfilling a couple different promises. You've got a promise that's going to come to David about his seed reigning forever. Some of that, I think, is still yet to come. Although the Lord does reign, he's going to physically reign at some point. But I think back to the promise of Abraham. Listen, it's through your seed, Abraham, that all nations will be blessed. I am going to be glorified through all nations from your seed, Abraham. The Old Testament continually points to Jesus Christ. David's life and his psalms often reflect both the things that happened in his life and the things that would come with the Messiah. David the prophet, the king, the poet, the warrior, he's an interesting guy. But he writes about the Lord and when he writes about the Lord and he writes about the Lord's deliverance over and over and over again, he just lays it at the Lord's feet and says, you deserve every ounce of glory and honor for this. You know, I imagine, I don't know what happened. You know what? I imagine that any time a heathen king came to interact with David, if there was ever any discussion about all of the ways that he had been blessed, you know how David would have laid that? You know what David would have done with that? David would have said, yeah, it's because of the God I serve. It's because of Jehovah. It's because of Jehovah. Now you look at our times and the glory of God, His gospel, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, is spread throughout all nations. I told the people that were here last week, whenever I, I jumped ahead a little bit, because I knew I wasn't going to be able to finish the whole chapter, but I jumped ahead a little bit and said, you know, when you hear this whole thing in Romans 15 about uh, the Gentiles, you know, that the, the, uh, the Lord being declared among the Gentiles, you ought to rejoice because that's you. That's you. If those little ones don't know what a Gentile is, you are one. 
the Lord Jesus Christ came and died that you might have redemption, that you might have a way of standing before him, spending an eternity with him. You know what we ought to be doing? We ought to be shouting the praises of the Lord. Let's set aside everything else. The fact that he saved us and has promised us an eternity with him, we ought to be ready and willing and able to go tell people about that. I have a feeling even if you set that aside and you look at your life, I bet if you tried, you could sit down and come up with a pretty interesting list of things that God has done for you. Things you've, he's delivered you from, protected you from, opened your eyes to, <laughs> grown you through the things you were going through. Do you give God praise for those things? When the opportunity arises and people ask about it, do you say, except for the grace of God, except for the mercy of God, except for the blessings of God, I wouldn't have been able to do it. It's really easy. It is really easy to, when you're having success, to just get caught up in the success. But David always took that back to God. Even in the middle of Psalms 18 where he was talking about the things he was doing, following God's statutes, following God, trying to stay close to God, trying to live righteously, trying to live upright. At the end of that, he said, it's God that lighted my path. It's God that did this. It's God that allowed me to be able to do this. We need to do the same thing. Praise him. Glorify him. Thank him for what he's done. Tell others about it, right? Make sure you're sharing what God has done. All right, Brother Philip, if you'd come and lead us in a song.